Good afternoon, Congressional Climate Campers. Welcome to the fourth installment of EESI's Congressional Climate Camp. I'm Dan Brissett, Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. EESI was founded in 1984 on a bipartisan basis by members of Congress to provide science-based information about environmental, energy, and climate change topics to policymakers. We've also developed a program to provide technical assistance to rural utilities interested in on-bill financing programs for their customers. Whether briefings or fact sheets, everything we do and produce is freely available and accessible online. And as always, the best way to stay up to date and ensure you never miss a thing is to visit our website at www.esi.org and sign up for our bi-weekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions. Here we are at the end of April, already time for Congressional, camp, Congressional Climate Camp number four. This year is zipping right by, and the fact that 2021 has been super busy so far in terms of climate and clean energy policy developments makes it feel even zippier. When we convened Congressional Climate Camp number three about a month ago, I said that Congress seemed to be hitting its stride after the passage of the big COVID-19 relief package. That still applies to Congress and the executive branch across a wide range of climate-related issues, infrastructure investments, changes in tax incentives, environmental justice, and of course, the update to the U.S. nationally determined contribution announced just last week. The President's speech on Wednesday night was the latest example of the priority and urgency being placed on climate change right now. Our first Congressional Climate Camp was focused on process and specifically how Congress and the administration enact appropriations, budget, and stimulus to advance climate solutions. Then in February, we considered federal policies for high emitting sectors, and specifically these five sectors, agriculture, power generation, buildings, industry, and transportation. In March, we look back, uh, we back, look back in time at previous policy proposals that have helped shape our present circumstances. We also talked a lot about bipartisanship and the benefits of working together when crafting and refining policy and how that process could and should be more inclusive going forward. Today, we will speak with five panelists about federal policy for mitigation and adaptation win-wins. There is a lot of buzz right now about infrastructure investments and stimulus and rightfully so, but sometimes there can be too little focus on policies that would also help us adapt to a warming planet and improve our resilience to climate impacts. So as we look at measures and proposals to cut emissions, which is really important, some that deserve special attention are the ones that also promote climate adaptation. We only have so much time to avert the worst impacts. So anything we can do that delivers multiple benefits still deserves a close look and quick action. And while we mitigate and adapt, we should also be especially mindful of the effects policies could have on frontline communities and the potential for our actions to also advance environmental justice goals. As always, each of these four online briefings is structured so we can break out individual presentations to help the busy staff and our audience target their learning. Everything, including slides and written summaries, will be posted online at www.eesi.org. And a condensed audio-only version of each Congressional Climate Camp will be available as an episode of our bi-weekly podcast, The Climate Conversation. Before I turn to our panelists, let me address some logistics. Uh, even though we have a busy agenda, you can still send us questions that we will try to incorporate into the discussion. If you have a question, uh, you have two options to ask it. You can send us a message on Twitter, at EESI online, or you can send us an email to EESI at EESI.org. Just to set realistic expectations though, with our packed agenda and the number of you watching right now, we will not be able to get to every question during today's session, but ask away anyway. We will follow up and do our best to answer every question submitted during Congressional Climate Camp. And now I get to introduce our first panelist. Dr. Baskar Subramanian heads the Shoreline Conservation Service for the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. Baskar works with various stakeholders, including federal, state, and local governments, the private sector, and citizens can, providing technical assistance for habitat creation and restoration projects. Baskar also administers Maryland's Zero Interest Loan Program to implement shoreline restoration projects for waterfront property owners. He's constantly working on opportunities to push the envelope on implementing innovative living shoreline projects that combines restoration with SLR and resiliency. Baskar, it is wonderful to see you today. 
I will turn it over to you. I'm really looking forward to your presentation. Thank you so much, Dan. Let me see. I want to start this. Uh, thank you again, Dan, for having me here. Um, I want to actually talk about building resiliency through restoration, the Maryland story. Um, I was asked to cover a couple of points and I um, let me actually go right to the topics. Uh, before I talk about living shorelines and resiliency and natu na natural and nature-based features, just want to give you a history of living shorelines. Um, in Maryland, we have about you know, 6,600 miles of shoreline and 16 coastal counties and erosion is, is a part of, uh, is a natural process that's happening in all of those coastal counties. Um, erosion is really not a bad thing. It's, it's, it actually is important for the ecological health of the estuary itself. Um, traditionally, living shoreline um, have been, uh, sorry, uh, erosion has been controlled by some techniques, like as you see here, revetments and bulkheads. In some cases, people have gone, um, you know, put revetment on top of bulkheads and bulkheads on top of revetment and, you know, trying to build the next Great Wall of China on in the shores of Maryland. It definitely a misguided, um, you know, effort. Uh, these structural projects have problems associated with them because these structures are trying to fight nature instead of working with it. Now, if you look at Maryland's shorelines, uh, almost 87% of the shorelines that we, we, we have experience what we consider slight erosion or no erosion at all. Now, the question then comes to why living shorelines? How are living shorelines better than structural approaches? Uh, the first and foremost, they are great for shoreline protection. They enhance habitat aesthetically, uh, shoreline, living shoreline projects are a lot nicer to see and use. Um, and most importantly, uh, living shorelines are great for uh, creating coastal resiliency. Now, one question that I get frequently asked is, is there one kind of living shoreline that is better than the other? And I, I try to tell folks that, you know, like many other things, one size does not fit all. Uh, there are many conditions that decide what kind of living shoreline project should be implemented um, in a given site, and they are dependent on the site conditions, the project objectives, and the, the energy regime that exists there. Now, in Maryland, we've had our fair share of severe storm events, extreme weather events. Uh, one of our biggest weather events was in 2003, Hurricane Isabel. Now, Isabel came with a surge of about eight feet. Um, and when, when it came on shore to Maryland, some of the uh, you know, structural projects that were there, we, we heard from people that these, these structural projects were trying to fight that surge. And so it was not able to stand a chance. And so we got calls at, in Maryland Department of Natural Resources. We got a lot of calls, folks telling that, you know, they're bulkheads. Is somewhere out in the bay, the revetment that they build, they spend a lot of money is also somewhere out in the bay. Whereas many of our projects that, you know, many of the projects that, you know, in, in their neighborhood, which are, you know, nature-based projects, which we did, um, still stayed intact. So that was a great, um, you know, testament for how, you know, living shoreline projects or nature-based projects are better than your structural projects. I want to give you a quick example. This is a, a case of a, this is an example uh, of a site, uh, Chesapeake Bay Environmental Center. Before uh, the living shoreline was done, there was a, a battered seawall on site. Uh, this restored about 400 linear feet of the shoreline. There are a couple of different innovative techniques that were actually used there. Um, we call it the living breakwaters. And then there was also an oyster reef component as part of the project. Now, um, you know, after the project was done, this is how it looked. I'm going to show you different angles of the same project after planting and af almost after three years, this, this, you know, the project looks like this. As a matter of fact, 
now in 20, 2021, almost you know, 18, 19 years after that, the place looks very similar to what you see on this picture. Now, my program, the Shoreline Conservation Service, has been in existence since um, the early 70s. And we've done an equal number of structural projects and living shoreline projects. And the, the breakdown that you see there tells you, uh, you know, if there's one message you want to take from this, and I would actually focus on the, the cost of these projects. The living shoreline projects are at least one-tenth of the cost of structural projects. Now, back in 2006, 2007, I went and assessed uh, about 200 living shoreline projects. And the, the general, uh, the, the conclusion that I came to was about 131 of those projects were doing good or better. And the second lesson I learned from that was investing in natural features like wetlands, forest buffers, dunes um, are the way, are, are, are how you want to move forward. Um, with natural buffers in place, communities have a better chance of bouncing back from climate related events. Now, this is how a conventional living shoreline project looked back then. This was probably you know, the mid 90s, early 2000. We, we attest to the fact that less is more. And so I usually draw people's attention to the fiberglass boards. The fiberglass boards of today are a lot lighter than what they used to be before. But guess what? They still work. And so right now we're focusing on strategically placing materials not trying to actually button up all the shorelines, every inch of them, and instead working with nature. This example is, is a, a great example of how we, we evolved where, you know, our projects. Um, here's another project where um, I have a before and after. The, the picture itself you know, tells uh, a thousand words. Um, so we are, we are steadily trying to innovate and push the envelope and think outside the box. And, and we feel that, you know, that is the way to actually move forward because we don't know what the, what, you know, with sea level rise predictions and with climate change and everything, we don't know how much it's going to be, we know it's happening, uh, but we don't know the extent of it. And so anytime working with nature would be the best way to do it. Um, in terms of legislation that have been supportive of living shorelines, one of the first legislation was done in 1968, the Shore Erosion Control Law, where natural uh, techniques were preferred over structural projects. Um, and after 30, 35 years of actually implementing these projects on the ground and learning from them, in 2008, Maryland passed the Living Shorelines Law, which basically put the onus on the property owners to prove to the state that living shorelines would not work on their shoreline. Maryland has in, in, um, invested a lot in the science and the implementation, and we, we strongly feel that the best coastal adaptation policy is for the science to actually inform the planning and policy and law, and the implementation project informs the science and, and future policies. Um, there are many publications that were actually put out over the years. And in 2010, DNR, Department of Natural Resources, uh, adopted a policy of incorporating climate change in all phases of a project. And with, with that, and then with, with other, um, you know, working with our partners like the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, we created, um, you know, manuals like the one on the right, the building resiliency through habitat restoration. And that is where the whole uh, building resiliency through restoration was formed. And this program, uh, Governor Hogan actually put money towards this, put grant money towards it. And this program, um, you know, it's called restoration, resiliency through restoration, which um, is uniquely different from any other programs out there in three ways. One, um, innovation is, um, you know, one of the first things that we want to do. You know, we strongly feel that, you know, innovating and, and pushing the envelope is the path forward. The second uh, aspect of this program is there's a very active monitoring uh, program associated with this. 
And because there is innovation involved in it and there is a risk involved in it, we've actually put aside some monies for adaptive management, which is very, very unique. Now, talk about financing options in Maryland, there are a, a slew of programs, you know, you know, from grant program, the one that I just talked to you about, the community residency grant program, uh, and the shore erosion, um, sorry, shoreline conservation service loan program. We've, uh, and again, there have been other programs through National Fish and Wildlife Foundation um, and, and Chesapeake Bay Trust, and so many organizations and agencies that have actually put money towards uh, investing in living shoreline practices. Now, there's been a consistent support, uh, federal support for um, natural and nature-based feature. The state CZM programs have, you know, effectively tackled uh, the, the emerging uh, coastal issues for almost 50 years. Um, CZM supports the congressionally recognized priorities um, like management, beneficial use, and the development of nation's coastal zone. We've, uh, the, the CZM program also um, believes that for a, to in order to have a healthy coastal resource, you know, it, it's extremely important to support economic drivers and conservation. Um, coastal communities are increasingly facing um, many coastal hazards, and the coastal management grant enables states to increase their efforts to effectively prepare for and mitigate impacts and quickly recover from these hazards. Um, states have, um, you know, states do this by priority investments through providing technical assistance, planning and implementation dollars. Um, you know, and, you know, with, with the current pan pandemic situation, we believe that, in, you know, uh, these, these projects, these resilient projects are held extremely important to ensure that the public is able to access these coastal areas and a continuous investment in coastal infrastructure projects help drive local job creation. Uh, blue carbon is another aspect that I was asked to cover as part of this presentation. Um, you know, in the coastal and you know, in a coastal system, wetlands and submerged aquatic vegetation are major, um, you know, uh, source for carbon storage and sequestration. Um, you know, blue carbon is, is really complicated. Um, you know, it's it got highly variable rates of sequestration. Uh, we have to also ac account for the methane emissions. Um, so there have been a couple of initiatives that we uh, are a part of. There's one initiative um, along with Restore America's Estuaries and Compass, which basically uh, is, is called the Blue Carbon Initiative, which highlight the ongoing work and identify research needs. And we are trying to actually see how you know, what co-benefits can, can these, um, you know, natural nature-based feature projects yield in terms of flood prevention and nitrogen processing and wildlife habitat. Uh, the other uh, group that we're, that we're working with is led by Duke University. It's called the U.S. Climate Alliance Blue Carbon Modeling Project. And there's, a, there's about six states involved in the project. And, and the whole idea is, you know, they're trying to actually create a model that can actually, um, you know, uh, you know, it, it basically Im impacts. I'm um, sorry, it, it models the impact of wetland changes in in 100 years on blue carbon and coastal wetlands. Um, you know, there are many funding sources that have actually contributed towards, you know, uh, reaching our target goals. Um, it is a, a minor. The blue carbon is a minor piece of that uh, big plan, but it definitely comes up with significant co-benefits. So the take home message is first and foremost, working with nature and not against it is one of the most important way to move forward. Um, the second thing, uh, the second uh, take home message is plan for tomorrow, today. This is my contact information for anybody who would like to actually reach out to me. And I'm done. That's awesome. A great presentation. Um, I have a follow-up question for you, um, if you don't, if you don't mind. Um, um, thank you very much for addressing blue carbon. Um, that's something we hear a lot about. A lot of congressional staff have questions about blue carbon. Um, I'm curious about 
how in your work you, what steps you take to ensure that living shorelines um, that are installed by these programs are well maintained and are not replaced in the future by, um, you know, a seawall sometime in the future or other structural improvements. And also, you know, if you have any thinking of, or if you have any thoughts about how that maintenance of living shorelines um, in order for blue carbon to continue to deliver benefits, it has to be there. Um, and uh, even though it's a minor, these other co-benefits are really powerful too. Um, what kind of steps are you taking to make sure that these projects are maintained in the future? So two things, and that's a, that's a very good point, Dan, because um, you know, if, if the 200 projects that I visited, if I have to say one take home message from those projects, it's not the kind of living children project, it's not the contractor who's actually doing it, it's the maintenance or the lack of. So that's a really, really important point. Now, in terms of maintenance, two things that we, we tend to actually do. One is to actually work with our partners, whoever the project partners are. We have a very strong tie with them. In many cases, um, it is private property owners. Um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a hard sell to actually make in the, in the, in the front end to actually, for them to actually invest in these natural nature-based projects. But once they are committed, I have not, I mean, in 15 plus years of work that I've been doing and the projects that I've been doing, I have not had a project where they've converted a living children project into a structural project because they're slowly but steadily seeing the, 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 the benefits, the co-benefits that are coming out of these projects. That's the first thing. The second thing is open lines of communication. We, we try to actually, you know, you know, my phone number, they, you know, anybody, any projects that I do, I still have a contact with them and I, they reach out to me and they say, Baskar, I have a problem with this, this, this areas. What do I do? And it is as simple as, you know, may, maybe moving a woody debris out of there or, you know, taking care of the invasive species. Those are some of the potential maintenance issues that I've actually seen over time. And so having that conversation, I've seen that actually helps a lot. That's great. I really appreciate that extra clarification. Um, thank you so much for your presentation today. Um, quick reminder to our audience before we move to our second panelist, quick reminder, if you missed any of that presentation, uh, if you would like to go back and visit the slides or revisit the slides, you can definitely do that. Um, everything will be posted online. We'll also have written summaries. Um, that may take a little bit of time to generate, but we'll have written summaries. You can also watch the entire archive uh, and you can also um, uh, watch individual segments. So thank you so much. And um, as a former state government employee in Maryland myself, thank you for your service and um, doing all of these great things for my adopted home state of Maryland. Thank you very much. Um, I get to introduce our second panelist now. Um, John Quinn is an associate professor of biology at Furman University in Greenville, South Carolina. His research and teaching emphasize concerns related to biodiversity, conservation, and sustainability. In particular, he focuses on conservation in managed ecosystems and sustainability of multifunction, uh, multi, multifunctional landscapes. His current research uh, focus is on how agriculture in urban landscapes and soundscapes in upstate South Carolina can be managed to conserve biodiversity and enhance ecosystem services. John, uh, nice to see you today. Uh, we'll turn it over to you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Dan, and thank you everyone for connecting today. I'm just going to share my screen here real quick. Oh. And you would think, so I actually need to move that over there. You would think I hadn't been teaching on Zoom for the last um, however long. Okay, um, so today I want to share some of the um, perspectives on solutions for climate change coming from an, uh, the agricultural sector. Um, as, as Dan introduced, I am a, a conservation biologist and interested in um, managing ecosystems as a whole. Um, and so a lot of the, the solutions are, are compelling because they're, they're essential for climate, you know, addressing climate change and um, both mitigation and adaptation to it. Um, but they also provide a diversity of other benefits. And so I, I'll be sure to highlight at the end uh, that kind of the takeaway that 
you know, if, if we're benefiting climate change, we're also, or addressing climate change, we're also benefiting um, biodiversity conservation or um, maintaining water quality. So um, why agriculture as a, as a place to start? Um, there are 22 million farms in the, um, in the United States, and those farms cover at least 92, um, 922 million acres. Um, so a substantial footprint in the, um, of, of land that is fundamental if we're going to uh, maintain food production, but also work to mitigate um, climate change. The, our agricultural systems, though, are, are diverse. I mean, this um, infographic from Bloomberg, you know, they highlight there's 650 million acres of pasture and range, um, which have, you know, a set of challenges and complexities, but also contributions when we think about maintaining um, soil organic carbon in our grasslands, um, but also, you know, 390 million acres of cropland. Um, those acres of cropland are you know likewise diverse. It's not just you know fields of lettuce in California and acres of corn in California, um, but a, you know a, a diversity of different um, um, food fiber and fuel products uh, that cover a significant portion of our landscape. From a, an, an economic perspective, you know why why agriculture and you know why is it part of, an important part of this conversation? Um, agriculture is in the in the U.S. on an annual basis an over three hundred and thirty dollar or three hundred and thirty billion a year in um, products, um, and that's that's spread between grains, right? We can see on the right, um, and you know fruits and vegetables, but also livestock, um, and so it is a, a diverse sector. And, and lastly, you know, if we think about the impacts of climate change, um, modeling projects that by you know, 2050 or in, in the future, um, yields are going to be affected across much of the um, United, you know, particularly in the Eastern United States, as temperatures increase, as um, the frequency of drought becomes more common, um, where we grow particular products and where our important agricultural regions, um, they may see um, yield shift. So what are our potential solutions then from the agricultural sector? Um, what options do we have before us that can potentially help address this? I, I always, I, I think I, I want to continue to um, re uh, restate the fact that agriculture is a diverse system. And so what might work in one area might not work in the other. Um, and so whether, you know, talking about range versus cropland or growing vegetables versus growing grains, um, in the same way, these, these six images here highlight the complexity of, of different agricultural systems. Um, everything from, you know, a highly irrigated system in the top middle in Kansas, where, you know, we think about what is the importance of irrigation e efficiency, um, to, you know, smaller diversified fields that, you know, might, you know, irrigation isn't the problem, but maybe, you know, uh, crop rotations are a more important solution. To, to kind of um, pull together a, a rich set of resources that are out there. Um, I'm, I'm going to you know, draw on the work that Project Drawdown has done over the last number of years, and they continuous, continuously update and um, analyze new data as it comes in, addressing different solutions to climate change from different sectors. Um, the panels here highlight some of the solutions in food, agricultural, and land use. Um, and in particular today, I want to highlight uh, conservation agriculture, um, some of the roles of regenerative farming, which is a, a very popular and important topic right now. Um, talk about farm irrigation efficiency and some of the programs that the federal government supports for that. Um, and then, you know, a little bit on grassland protection and, you know, this idea that, you know, main agriculture is part of the landscape. But then also on the individual consumer, you know, how do, um, how does diet and our particular diets, um, uh, contribute to greenhouse gas, gas emissions, but also what are some of the co-benefits to shifting to a plant-based diet. Conservation agriculture is a diverse um, set of practices um, that work to conserve both the soils, but also the ecosystem structure and function. Uh, each of the analyses that Project Drawdown has done highlights by between 2020 and 2050, the gigatons of carbon equivalent either reduced or sequestered. And so we can see here that conservation agriculture um, is predicted to you know, help sequester you know, between nine and 13 gigatons. 
They've also identified either funds saved or you know, profit that can come from these particular practices. Um, and so we can see here, you know, 78 to 113 billion dollars in net profit um, back to farmers, landowners, or, or different practitioners from these particular practices. Some of the practices that are in included um, are no-till farming, where you know, planting a, a crop here, we can see it looks like soybeans planted into corn from last year. Um, from the previous year and this this is valuable because it you know less uh, disturbance of the soil um, but also you know that helps maintain carbon but can um, reduce er erosion so we can start thinking about what are some of those co-benefits cover crops are a um, increasingly frequent and, and valuable tool um, and we're you know, again sequestering carbon um, but keeping continuous living cover on the land and we can see here it looks like clover interplanted with wheat and then lastly uh, crop rotation so diversifying our farming systems from just a you know corn soybean rotation to maybe including wheat or alfalfa or you know choosing different crops um, whether it's you know, amaranth or sorghum in the particular area uh, that, that provides different values, um, but ultimately, you know, sequesters more carbon and helps mitigate against climate change. As we think about incentivizing different practices, um, I do think it's, it's important to think about, you know, how likely they are to be integrated in the near and long term and, and how do we kind of consider that in our, our practices. Um, this figure here highlights we can see on the bottom left-hand corner practices that have low potential of adoption in the next 10 years um, and um, low integration in today's agriculture versus ones that you know, here have high potential for adoption um, and high potential um, in um, our current practices. And so we started thinking about what might be important. We can see here that today crop rotations and crop choice are not integrated well into today's agricultural systems, but have high potential in the next 10 years. Uh, we can also see reduced tillage over here um, has medium integration, but high potential for adoption. And so incentivizing particular programs to adopt those practices more broadly is, is needed. Regenerative agriculture is um, similar to the practices of uh, uh, conservation agriculture. Um, uh, it, it has, you know, it's developing in what its specific practices are, but, you know, in addition to the giga, you know, gigatons of carbon sequestered and the profits here, it's an important area or a valuable area to potentially link um, public and private efforts. A lot of uh, major corporations are investing um, very seriously into regenerative practices, including General Mills, PepsiCo, and Patagonia here. Um, and so if, you know, working on these, you know, corporate um, but you know, government relationships can be a, a, a nice opportunity in, in this field of regenerative farming. Farming irrigation efficiency is, is one that I hadn't necessarily thought about before preparing um, for this um, talk today. Uh, but we can see here, you know, both again, you know, not as many as, as great of a carbon savings, uh, but a significant amount of, um, of economic savings here. It is a great opportunity though to highlight, you know, two particular programs that the USDA runs. Um, one within the USDA, there is the Natural Resource Conservation Service, which can provide important information for farmers, that direct translation for how do we protect water, air, soil. Uh, but one particular program that is um, well-funded and, and popular is EQIP. Um, EQIP is a program that will, will help farmers in, um, invest in infrastructure or management um, techniques that will improve their farm sustainability. One of those that they do invest in frequently is improved irrigation. Um, so this is an important area to continue to support. Um, a a, a um, long-standing and, and diverse practice is agroforestry. Um, agroforestry includes everything from silvopasture management, where you know having um, livestock. We can see here, you know, pigs. Uh, a project we did down here in South Carolina. Um, we looked at you know how integrating pigs into um, a silvopasture system, where trees and some sort of um, commodity, whether it's corn or livestock are co-produced in the same land. Uh, the silver pasture provides mutual benefits um, for you know, maintaining tree cover, um, but the farmer gets you know, economic revenue on an annual basis. Um, windbreaks and uh, windbreak renovation are, are two really important ones that um, have a, a long history of, of research in the, uh, in the US. 
The, I, I wanted to highlight the USDA National Agroforestry Center, uh, which it, I believe is based in Lincoln, Nebraska, unless they've moved. Uh, but there's a lot of great research that has come out of Nebraska um, in the past and, and continues to come from uh, the National Agroforestry Center. Uh, but practices like windbreaks are, are valuable because one, you have that carbon stored in the biomass of the tree, uh, but it also helps protect the crops as a whole. Um, a windbreak can have a, you know, a increase the yields on the land by 10 to 12% uh, just by being present. And that considers the land loss to the particular practice. As we consider these different um, types and opportunities for interventions, I think it's important to consider, this, consider the scale. Um, so a lot of things that in those conservation or regenerative practices um, fit at that field or, or maybe the, the farm or cropping system scale. So we can see tillage management. So we talked about no-till um, and crop irrigation as being field scale practices that you know, we can incentivize and encourage farmers to support. Crop choice um, is, uh, requires more coordination um, across a farm, um, but then ultimately management of, of landscape elements, so semi-natural or natural landscape elements, um, is, is work that requires networking among different farmers. And I wanted to you know, talk about the Conservation Reserve Program as, as kind of a context for that. Um, the Conservation Reserve Program is a, a longstanding program that funds farmers to idle land. Um, they, um, it is the largest, in the, uh, definitely the largest in the U.S. private land conservation program. I mean, you can see that you know the the amount spent um, in total CRP acres has, has leveled off, but is um, balanced um, is continuing to be supported. Um, recently, the um, the program, uh, the conservation reserve program, so just last week, um, was um, in set, you know promoted by Tom Vilsack, the newest Secretary of Agriculture. Um, and so I, I think this is a space where we will continue to see funding grow. Uh, just a, a couple of last points here. Um, we can see that um, the conservation is a relatively small portion of the USDA budget. Um, and so that is um, important for us to, to recognize. Um, and agroecology practices that really focus on these sustainable systems are a much even smaller component of that. Uh, there are great projects or programs out there. Um, the USDA climate hubs provide regional information on data and synthesis, um, tools and new technology. But then it, I, I want to kind of end talking about stakeholder education and engagement, which, which is a role that, that these groups fill. Um, a lot of our work that we're focused on here currently, you know, thinks about how relationships between farmers and their land between farmers is so important to enhance sustainability. So just paying farmers um, doesn't always work to increase these practices or just telling them they have to do it. Um, farmers are great communicators and great sharers. Um, and when they share ideas and get excited about it, um, it moves more quickly through the system. And lastly, um, what about consumers since um, we all eat? Um, if we look at particular diet types, we can see here that a um, plant-based diet um, has greater um, or has lower greenhouse gas emissions as compared to fish or livestock. Um, but importantly, you know, thinking about multiple co-benefits, um, these same diets of Mediterranean, pescatarian, vegetarian diets um, have reductions in different health um, um, health, uh, so we can see diabetes, cancer, coronary mortality, and then all causes of mortality are all reduced um, by these particular diet types. So in conclusion, um, kind of thinking about, you know, what is sustainable agriculture and how does it contribute? Um, climate change is part of that. And I've, um, where we, we think about, you know, some of the benefits that um, climate change can provide. Uh, and, you know, these diagrams from John Foley highlight that agriculture is you know, can be just for crop production. We can sign to that middle practice, but if we think about these as multifunctional landscapes. Uh, we can transform something, you know, a, a landscape that looks like this to something more diverse like this that balances out um, different agricultural needs and demands. Alrighty, so um, I will stop there. Um, and if folks have any questions, uh, my email is at the bottom and always happy to, to share and chat with others. Thank you, John, for a great presentation. Um, if anyone just joined us and you wanted to go back and look at any of John's slides or Baskar's slides, um, everything that we covered today will be posted online, www.esi.org. 
Um, John, I have a question for you about something that you said. Um, we have a lot of people watching this right now um, and a fair amount of them are staff people on Capitol Hill who represent members of Congress from all over the country. You said something along the lines of what works in one area might not work in another. And I'd like you, I, I have a question for you. Are there areas of the country where it would make the biggest, where we would realize the greatest adaptation or mitigation benefits from some of these practices? How, um, how, how is that information shared? Is there a way for staff to, uh, I guess this is a second part of the question. Um, if staff have questions along what works in their state or where their districts, where would you refer them to? Yeah, um, I would, so yes, what, what might be a valuable practice in one part of the country might not work with another. And that can be the same from within a county where, you know, someone is in, you know, a, more of a wetland area and, you know, those particular practices. And so um, really working with local NRCS agents is a really valuable um, tool to, for, for farmers um, and supporting it more broadly. Um, I, you know, the climate hubs are important because they provide region specific information. Um, in the same way, the, if you, if we talk specifically about agroforestry, uh, they have a little decision making tool to say, which region are you in? Which um, agroforestry practices do we have data on? Um, and here's the best recommendations for those. Um, and so, yes, it is, I mean, the US is a very large diverse country um, and ecosystems, you know, it, it goes from you know, temperate deciduous forest to across grasslands and wetlands. And so it is, it is complex and diverse in that sense. Well, thank you very much for your excellent presentation. I learned a lot. Um, and I was really impressed by the size of some of those numbers, um, not just the sequestration reduction numbers, but the cost savings and profit numbers. Um, to, Pretty powerful drivers, I would think. It is powerful, and I would encourage everyone to check out Project Drawdown because they do have those numbers mm -hmm. for each of the different practices, and it, it is a, a, a well-referenced um, and, 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 again, continually updated as we learn more about, you know, what are nature-based solutions for um, climate change. Well, thank you again for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Um, we will move to our third presenter of the day. Um, Russ Vaughan was born and raised in Colville, Washington. Uh, Russ previously worked in many capacities, including sales, marketing, operations, and leadership for his family's company, uh, Vaughan Brothers Lumber. A new opportunity, however, uh, in the form of cross-laminated timber inspired a professional change for Russ in 2017 when he started a new separate company called Vaughan Timbers that is now producing cross-laminated timber uh, uh, and, and beams and columns. The company has delivered projects all over the United States uh, and even projects in Europe. Russ has uh, served as chairman of Timber Product Manufacturers Association, chairman of the Western Wood Products Association Export Committee, and currently serves on the board of Sustainable Northwest and the Northeast Washington Forest Coalition as past president. Russ, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm looking forward to learning all about mass timber and cross-laminated timber. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Appreciate that introduction. And I'll uh, share my screen here. Let's see. There we go. Okay, yeah, as Dan said, I, I'm from Northeast Washington State, and we, uh, we've got a pretty unique uh, proposition um, in terms of not only utilizing our resources differently, but also uh, looking at carbon and climate change in a little different way. Um, we're trying to adapt a centuries old technology and, and building materials, building science industry uh, to, to deal with the issues that we have of the day. And uh, we've been working on this for quite some time. As Dan mentioned, I'm, I'm part of the Northeast Washington Forest Coalition. And what that is, it's a group of environmentalists, uh, forest professionals. My family's business, uh, Vaughan Brothers Lumber, was I was vice president of and ran operations for about 17 years before starting Vaughan Timbers. And it was really the driver, the why, if you will, to, to, to start Vaughan Timbers because we wanted to show the consumer and give the consumer an opportunity 
to support the kinds of forest activities and forestry activities that they wanted. And, and when we started to share with the public what we were doing in terms of thinning forests, and in particular fire prone forests, we got a lot of attention and people wanted to buy from us. But uh, in a sawmill uh, capacity, you're selling a commodity in bulk. So if somebody wants to build a house or frame a basement or build a deck, uh, we couldn't really, unless they were local, sell that to them. So they, we would have to point them to a distribution network and it didn't quite work really well. And when I discovered cross laminated timber and mass timber in general, it really was like a light switch and then seeing how it worked in Europe and then being able to apply the sensibilities that we have here in North America became uh, really interesting. So you'll see our tagline is forest to frame and that is because we really focus on what happens in the forest and bring it all the way through the market. So we look at it in similar ways as you would see um, our food system. So we want uh, people to be able to decide whether they want just a, a product that sequesters carbon and they don't really care too much about where it uh, comes from or want to dig into those details and maybe eco-friendliness isn't at the top of their list. Um, but still to know that what they're buying is sustainable and it is is good and we look at it in terms of like good better and best practices so we want people to be also able to choose do i want a certified product that comes from fsc managed forest lands or do i want to find something that's really local it has a low carbon footprint while it harvests those materials and maybe doing what we do which is forest restoration and the byproduct of those activities going into products. So we'll show you a little bit about that today, but all those things are really interesting. We're helping do some things that will help the environment. And at the same time, we're building really incredible high tech, energy efficient buildings for the next generation and beyond. And that, that's really exciting. So I'll start my presentation with the era of mega fires. Um, this is a presentation done by Paul Hesburgh. He's a PhD scientist with the US Forest Service. And if you haven't seen his presentation, I'd encourage you to do so. He really digs deep into why we're having these mega fires. Of course, climate change and, and uh, other factors are exacerbating this issue. And it's not as simple as just going and cutting our forests and we'll, be, we'll fix this thing. It's somewhere nuanced in between. And we can have an effect on this. And, and, and I think knowing that's important, there are actions we can take at scale that will really help this. And I wanted to highlight this image. This is one that, that, that I actually took. This is a, a forester for Vaughan Brothers Lumber, the company that I used to work for before starting Vaughan Timbers. And this area was a project area for a collaboratively developed project that was already approved and ready to be sold in October. And the fire started in August of that same year. So it passed all the oversight, everything that the Forest Service does, but this also went through a collaborative process where the local and regional environmental communities bought into the thinning and the activity that was gonna go on here. And the fire beat us to it and destroyed this landscape. And, and that to me is really a driver into what we do. We want to be uh, a force for good. And this doesn't help anybody. And you can see in the, in the foreground there that the, the 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 ground is really torched in a hot way and that's unnatural um, at the scale that we're burning our forest right now and that's why we need to reduce these fuel loads when i mean fuel i mean the brush the trees everything that's out there the loading is just far too high we have you know thousands and thousands of trees three five seven thousand trees per acre and naturally, we're supposed to have larger trees with wider spacing that are uh, resistant to wildfire. So we can do that. And we've been putting out these fires for the last you know, 50 to 100 years. And what that's done is it's allowed a lot of these smaller trees that would have burned in more intermittent fires to grow up into the canopy and put everything at risk. We can do something about it. And this is the result. So this is a forest restoration project where we left the biggest and best trees behind. The byproduct of this activity actually goes to the sawmill and we utilize small diameter logs. I think that's also a misconception that um, 
the forest industry has to have large, big, old growth trees. That's totally shifted. And over the last 30 to 40 years, everything has shifted towards a smaller diameter. One, because there's more smaller diameter material in, in these managed lands that, are, that have roads and are already been managed. But it's also just become more effective to <clears throat> batch the logs together and process them. And this is an example of the trees that come off of those lands. So what you see here is, is a log that is like four and a half inches in diameter up to about the steering wheel size of the car. That's the material that's being used. That's the byproduct of this forest restoration work that creates healthy forests that look like this. The result is the byproduct. So I, I like to tell people, this is the product. This is the focal point, the, the beautiful, thinned out, healthy forest. And the byproduct is what we need to be building our buildings with. And so we take those logs into the mill. And this gives you a little bit of a depiction, this, this imagery here, where those small logs are then stacked in bulk under a crane. They're separated by size and species. They're, they're run into the mill. They then, uh, we, we turn them into rough lumber. And when I say we, that's Boggan Brothers Lumber and other sawmills like it, which we also buy from at our facility. And then once that lumber is created, we further process it. We finger join it together to make it long. And then we make either cross laminated timber, which you see there in the bottom left, or glue lamb products like glue laminated timber panels, glue lamb columns, and glue lamb beams. And that's down there on the bottom in the right. We're also using very high technology when it comes to CNC equipment, digital fabrication, 3D modeling, some of the things that are the latest advances in building science. And it allows us to build buildings smarter with less waste, they're more energy efficient. And we tie together these, um, the, the mechanical, electrical, and plumbing aspect of these buildings back to the factory. So there's less waste and it's just more efficient. So it's a really good process. So we're not asking people to um, trade off some of the, the benefits of building or that we're, we're building something that's eco-friendly to manufacture yet not energy efficient in the building. Or we're, we're, what we're doing is we're, we're taking that carbon that's in that forest that would otherwise burn, we're encapsulating it in the wood, then we're putting in these buildings. And the beautiful part about it, these buildings are also going to be uh, able to be reused and recycled if the building has to come down at some point in the future. And we've seen in many of the markets, uh, urban markets that we operate in, where when they take down an old warehouse that was built a century ago and has these big heavy timbers in it, that's some of the most valuable wood in the marketplace, reclaimed heavy timbers. That's what we're essentially gonna be putting into these structures. Um, we also go beyond that. We can make really beautiful things out of wood, like this spiral staircase at the University of Oregon. Um, it turned out wonderfully. This is, um, these are from small logs, forest restoration activity. They're um, in small pieces, so we were able to get maximum usage out of the material. And it just, it, it's another way to put um, carbon uh, stored into the, the simple staircase of a building, but it also has an aesthetic that people really love. This is another neat project that we were part of. Um, you're looking at the outside cladding, which is a reclaimed wood with a, with a steel panel that goes over a all CLT constructed module. These are 14 units on eight separate buildings on what used to be two single family lots in Spokane, Washington. It's, it's an area that's starting to be a little bit more urban, a little bit more um, enjoyed by foot traffic. So uh, some friends of mine in Spokane created a development called Blockhouse. Um, it's blockhouselife.com if you wanna check it out. There's some small units in there for Airbnb. So if you're ever in Spokane, you could stay there and check that out. But it's also um, really neat to see, especially in this uh, post-COVID uh, world that we're in, this is another way to do um, uh, an increase in density, but also not have everybody so packed tight together. So there's 14 units here. There's the, the people are able to, to stay there and have their own space, yet be in together in a community. And you can you can get this more dense, but it's also just it's interesting how fast this stuff goes together. We were building each one of these units from a structural standpoint 
in, in about a week or less. And then we were doing the rest of it uh, very rapidly. And these are getting better and more common as we see more modular construction. This is a project that we're doing this summer, also in Spokane, Washington. It's, it's a, gonna be an incredible project. It's actually um, a house as part of a uh, ALS charity called Matt's Place. Um, the Matt, who the charity is named after, he's, he's uh, still alive and doing well. He's got, a, he's got ALS, he's in a motorized chair and he started a foundation. He wanted to show people what's going on with ALS and, and how to make life easier for those that have it. So we teamed up with Miller Hall Architects. Um, Andy Barrett is on their board. He's the, the brains behind Blockhouse. And we're building this this summer. It's gonna be an ALS specific um, house where the, all of the functions inside are made to make life easier for somebody who's afflicted with ALS. We're really proud of this. And we think it's gonna be a really awesome uh, project that's gonna serve many purposes and could be expanded across the country. Uh, I also wanted to show another uh, application for this product. This is the Oregon State University Cascades campus in Bend, Oregon. Um, we did all of the panels and uh, we did all the fabrication for the glue lamb as well. And this was constructed very rapidly. But the really cool thing is Bend is in a fire adapted landscape. It's got forest fires that happen in and around it. And we took products from those areas to thin forests out, um, not specifically right at Bend, but in, in our area, which is about uh, four hours away. And uh, we put that, that material that would otherwise create wildfires into this building. And now it's gonna survive and provide a wonderful place for people to learn and, and, uh, and become educated for years and years to come. So, that's my presentation, and I'd be happy to answer any questions and, and further this discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Russ, uh, for uh, a really great presentation. Um, I know it's a little rude, but I kind of want to invite myself over to go on a field trip to Washington and maybe you're check out those facilities. Anytime. They looked awesome. No, you're welcome to any time. <laughs> we actually, uh, um, to that point, um, and, and people on this seeing this may know this or not, but big tech has really put a big push on making their buildings eco-friendly. And uh, I'm under NDA under a lot of projects with them, but you know we're we're taking I've got some samples here, so we, we're taking this cross-laminated timber product and we're we're building their new facilities out of these wonderful products, and we see that as a real opportunity to tell the story. Um, their leaders, they have the capital to push this forward because that's what their employees are asking for. They want them to be more sustainable and use the best products they can. But we also invited some of the key leadership to do what I just showed you in this presentation in real time and real life. So we took a few people from Google, uh, Microsoft, Amazon, um, Facebook. We went out in the forest we walked through where we had already done treatment. I think it really shows people that um, we're not always talking about a clear cut. We're talking about a forest that's actually in better shape now than it was when we found it. And it's got environmental oversight, which is really great. Then we take them to the sawmill, show them how that log gets processed, how we use all of the wood chips, all of the bark, all the sawdust, the shavings, they all have a product and they enhance our lives. So we're using everything possible and then adding even more value by turning it into mass timber. And we're, we're replacing um, and giving another option besides just standard steel and concrete in these commercial structures. And there is a place for steel and concrete, but we've been doing too much of it. And I think it's, we need an alternative that isn't such a high cost when it comes to carbon when we manufacture our products. It looked really impressive, um, not just the sort of the the facility, the, the timber facility itself, but the projects look fantastic. Yeah, um, I have two questions for you. Um, one, um, I just like to sort of get your perspective. We covered mass timber as part of our Workforce yeah. Wednesday's briefing series. Yeah. Um, and I was just curious, um, in as your company has grown, um, if you could comment a little bit about the workforce development opportunities that it's brought to that part of the country and um, my yeah. assumption is that those opportunities may not have been there before your company created those jobs. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So 
Yeah, we, we're in a fortunate place. We're in a rural community north of Spokane that does have a fair bit of manufacturing. Um, you know, we had that in the you know, 70s and 80s, and then a lot of that manufacturing went offshore. And so, um, but what we're bringing to the table is the next level, high tech stuff that people are able to go get a, uh, a community college degree or a work source focused degree and add their, uh, to their skills and get paid more for them. So when we're running a, a computer numeric control system, which is a CNC, that takes a little bit more than just your average high school degree. You need more uh, focus and energy. Some of that's on the job, but some of that comes from um, education. But it's also like the, we're, we're tying the gap tighter between building sciences and manufacturing. And you know, the traditional way we build is there's a, there's a design team. So an owner is gonna do a building. They're gonna develop a building. I'm in Seattle today. So we're gonna develop a building in Seattle. Typically you have an architect that starts it and leads the project. They bring on an engineer. They go through, they render it, and then they 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 build it in a in kind of this um, this vacuum, and then they engineer it so it'll stand up and withhold the, the the test of time. Then they get a general contractor. Then that general contractor, after the permits are granted, goes out and sources the material. But now with with not only uh, mass timber but others. Um, we're doing so many parts in one spot that we're bringing a much it's much different than just materials. It's not just a collection of materials and people putting it together. So we now are educating the, the uh, developers, the architects and so on. We need to be part of that team because we need to be able to go through that process so you can one, develop a cost, but understand how to build it, understand how to optimize it and make it most efficient. So it's, it is a paradigm shift and it's drawing it back to forest management. And we think that's a really good thing. So people should know where their products come from. And the sort of second follow-up question, you addressed this at the, be the beginning of your presentation, but I'd like just to ask you about it again, because I think for a lot of staff people, maybe there's a, an inconsistency and incong incongruity here between you know, the idea that, well, using more wooden buildings, how is that not actually bad? for forests. Yeah. Just very briefly, could you explain a little bit more about how increased use of, of wood in buildings is actually um, good for our forests or could be good yeah. for our forests? Yeah, so we have like two types of things going on in our forest. We've got some very actively managed industrial timberlands. Um, and that's just kind of market-based stuff. And, and that's out there. The other side of it is we have a lot of federally owned and managed lands. And what happened in the, you know, this, the 1960s, 1970s led into the 80s was a growing environmental movement, a growing focus on what are we doing out in our landscape, in particular our public lands. And the, the Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management, which between the two of them, I think it's about 400 million acres um, and not all of it's forested, but the bulk of it is. Um, basically, they decided in the, the late 80s and early 90s that we've got to change some things. And instead of changing and adapting, they stopped. So we went from like 12.6 billion board feet annually of harvest on, those, on the Forest Service lands in particular, we dropped down to 1.8 billion. We've never got over 3.3 billion since then. It might be 3.5. Um, and we've changed technology. So we're counting smaller trees now that we weren't counting when we were developing those numbers before. So we've, in that every year during that time, the trees have grown, not only like up, but out. And we filled the forest with all of this fuel. And we need to go back and revisit that. We don't need to look at it from an extraction standpoint. We have areas like on the Colville National Forest where the federal uh, lands are contributing back $1,000 an acre while they're doing forest restoration because the infrastructure is built for that place. You go to someplace like New Mexico or Eastern Arizona or parts of Wyoming and Colorado and, and Utah where they've lost their forest infrastructure because that forest reacted a little, I think, too aggressively uh, to the, the 
um, concerns of the public instead of shifting, right? So there should have been a shift, but what we got was a, a shutdown. And so we lost the infrastructure. So now it's costing the government $1,000 an acre and very limited scope in the treatments that they can do around these communities and other infrastructure where if we right size the forest industry and we bring sawmills that are dedicated to that small diameter back into those communities, we can create products that really work well. And I think that creating that market, and I know we have a really crazy lumber market right now that's got a lot of factors that go into it. Um, we shouldn't focus on that. We should focus on what we need to do for the long term. We need to manage our federal forest lands. That does not include talking about roadless areas. It does not include wilderness areas. It talks about managing the already roaded, previously managed landscapes in and around communities. And these communities in many cases have already gone through the process to identify those lands. We just need to have the um, institutional fortitude to go implement these things. And as we talk about an infrastructure plan um, going across the country, I think that is a critical thing and it adds jobs to your other point in communities where they're really critical. And I saw a stat recently, as well within the last two or three years, where if you looked at the impact of jobs in rural communities versus jobs in urban communities, you know, if you had a hundred jobs in a community of three or 4,000 people, the impact is like hundreds of thousands of jobs in a major metro marketplace. So I think those are just important things. There's a ripple effect there and a circular economy that we can create. And I would just say there are examples around the world where they're doing this, right? They're doing this in places like Sweden and in Norway and in Austria, where they are not over harvesting their lands. And they're creating these wonderful products that come from nature that are high efficiency buildings and everything else. So yeah, I know it's a long winded answer to your question, but you know, we're really passionate about it. I think it's a wonderful thing. No, that was great. Uh, really, really great information. And those sorts of job um, impacts, something we talk a lot about at ESI as well yeah. uh, with respect to biofuels um, and communities that generate. Um, and it doesn't, you know, you bring up biofuels and, and, you know, bioenergy and things like that. This all ties in with the forest management. And so that, it's, it's something that if, we get the right players at the table, we can create something really powerful. Great. Well, thank you uh, very much for joining us today, Russ. Uh, thank really you for having presentation. me. Um, Russ, you mentioned in your presentation, uh, energy efficiency and resilience, and that brings us right to our fourth panelist. Uh, so thank you very much, Russ, for that segue. Uh, I get to introduce my friend, Kim Cheslak. Kim is a Building Energy Codes leader and content matter expert. Uh, she guides the future of Building Energy Codes uh, through the United States. She's worked on building codes uh, for over 10 years. She has um, led commercial and residential code compliance studies. She's worked with local governments to maximize savings through adoption of and compliance with building energy codes. Um, she's actively enforcing, or, and as well as actively enforcing energy and green construction codes in the District of Columbia as a code official. Uh, she is with New Buildings Institute now, and her work focuses on assisting leading jurisdictions to improve their use of building carbon and energy policies to achieve their climate goals. Kim, it is great to see you. I can't wait for your presentation. It's been a while since I've heard a good Building Energy Codes presentation, so I'm, I'm due. I'm looking forward to this. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Dan. Um, and can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. I'm going to get this going. Okay. Um, great. Thanks for having me here today. Again, um, like Dan said, my name is Kim Cheslek. I'm the Director of Codes with New Buildings Institute. Um, just if you're sort of unaware of, of NBI, um, we're a mission-driven nonprofit. We're based in Portland, Oregon, and we work to push for better buildings that achieve the zero carbon future. Uh, that we all need. So I want to start real quick with just a brief Building Codes 101, um, just to make sure we're all talking from the same page here. So Building Codes are basically just laws that regulate how we design and build. They cover everything from structural design to energy use, that includes things like plumbing and mechanical systems, fire protection and safety, 
basically you can't build or renovate a structure without complying with these regulations. So they have the potential largest impact on our building stock in the United States. There are three primary codes writing bodies, uh, the International uh, Code Council, ASHRAE, and NFPA. Um, they are somewhat coordinated, but each have a sort of a slightly different structure and a slightly different scope in what uh, they provide out to the market in terms of those codes and standards. Codes and standards are largely developed by having a committee in some form or another. Um, each of the codes and standards that I just mentioned have a, a process for proposals to be submitted basically by anyone. Um, you all could submit one uh, code changes. I certainly submit code changes, but it's, it's a generally open process. Um, those proposals are sent out for public comment after they're vetted, proposals are finalized and voted on, um, and new editions of these codes come out approximately every three years. So I want to put in context here why we're talking about buildings and building energy codes. Um, you know, I did say that the code is the largest way to impact buildings, but buildings are responsible for 75% of the nation's electricity consumption, about half of its fossil gas consumption. This contributes to about 38% of U.S. emissions. Uh, this, these numbers can quickly be driven down to zero. A typical office building in the United States, um, existing building, uses a lot of energy, right? So we can build a new building today at net zero energy that uses 70% less than any existing building um, in terms of energy. It can use 46% less than sort of the US base code. And what this means is that one net zero energy building in the United States will save 169 tons of greenhouse gases per year. So again, why buildings? Um, President Biden has recommitted the United States to the Paris Agreement. Meeting these goals means cutting greenhouse gas emissions by 50% by 2030, getting to net zero by 2050, re-entering that actual agreement, and most importantly, limiting our global warming to one and a half degrees Celsius. By impacting buildings, we can eliminate 20% of current US carbon emissions. So, I'm gonna spend some time today previewing for you what it might look like to have a building code for climate. The big piece I wanna emphasize here before we dive in a little bit further is uh, making sure you guys understand the difference between embodied carbon and operational carbon. Um, this is a quick graphic that I uh, borrowed from Skanska. I think it does a pretty good job. Embodied carbon is basically anything that is used to construct the building and then operational carbon is anything once the building is is constructed in operations uh, in operations what it is consuming um, to run under normal circumstances at nbi we like to talk about um, carbon neutral buildings with these sort of five foundations and and these are the way that we uh, consider one, the loading order of what needs to be done to achieve net zero carbon buildings, um, and two, just the total scope of what needs to be done to achieve those. And so those are energy efficiency, renewable energy, grid integration and storage, building electrification, and then life cycle impacts. We're going to talk a little bit more about each of these. So a building code for climate, what would that mean? Um, within each of these foundations, there has to be a scope of what we would mean when we're talking about creating a code for climate and what the goal would be. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about each of these. But I wanted to add another layer in here. Um, and I know that Jackie uh, is going to talk to us a little bit more about this, but there's got to be also an equity component. Um, when we're talking about all of these pieces and talking about building codes, it's really easy to take ourselves out and say like, oh, this is just a law, there's legal limits, um, and, and how does this impact people or how does this impact me? Um, you know, we do at NBI want to focus our work around equity um, while still being able to provide sort of science-based and technical solutions to the building space. So energy efficiency. The key that we're talking about here is really impacting those base codes and building systems to achieve highly efficient, passively resilient buildings. Um, we've seen instances like this picture I have in the background here where all of a sudden um, our buildings are subjected to more uh, extreme weather than we sort of expected them to be. So there's a couple pieces in play in the energy efficiency space. We have the energy code. Um, the IECC, which is one of the uh, primary energy codes, just put out the 2021. We estimate that it's got a 10% gain in efficiency over the last um, 
code cycle, but it also produced the most challenges to the code development process um, that we've ever seen. And those challenges actually changed the IECC from a code to a standard, which I know is a little bit in the weeds um, for this group, but basically what that did is it removed the voting process from governmental members or the users of the code and put it now into a committee. And those, that call for committee just closed um, last Friday. So we're waiting to see what that process will really provide for us in the future. Then there is a companion standard um, that's released by ASHRAE. The 90.1 uh, 2019 determination was just released. Um, it was about a 5% improvement in energy efficiency. ASHRAE has also been moving forward to form a building decarbonization task force and has released standard 228P, which is focused on building decarbonization, which is open for public comment right now. The work that's done by ASHRAE is supported by the National Lab, so we sort of know again that it has um, a strong technical foundation. I want to say neither of these standards or codes have committed to moving towards um, a net zero energy or a climate-based solution. Uh, th they're just sort of moving in the right direction, but that sort of progress is not consistent and it's not assured. We have a real opportunity. Um, these are the codes that we are tracking at NBI that are developing between now and 2023. And 2023 becomes a real important target because um, the science will tell us that for, to stay on track to that 1.5 degree target based on our building stock, we need to have all electric new construction by 2025. Um, and so if we don't impact these codes, like I said, three year cycle, these codes that are on this map here in the next 18 months, we're really gonna miss a huge opportunity. The next piece that goes into this code for climate is focus on renewable energy. We need to provide on-site, off-site um, and procurement regulations that help us achieve resilience but also support state renewable portfolio standards and really focus on additive generation. Um, state renewable portfolio standards, I'm not sure how familiar this group is with that, you know, but um, since 2000, approximately 50% of US renewable electricity generation and capacity has been driven by state RPS. Uh, and what those do is they specify the percentage of retail electric sales that must be supplied through renewable electricity. Today, 31 states, including DC and Puerto Rico, have a renewable portfolio standards, and that represents nearly 220 million people, or over 65% of the U.S. population. Out of these 31 states, four, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, Virginia, and Washington, D.C., are striving for 100% renewable electricity. And we're starting to include this in the code. So, we've made the leap from like, what does this mean to have these other policies out there and how do we regulate it? In the 2021 IECC, there's two options for the inclusion of renewable energy um, in the code, both a residential and commercial zero energy appendix. Um, some of this language has also been refined and proposed into ASHRAE 189.1 to include the um, solar generation as mandatory on new commercial construction. All right, next step, electrification. This one's a little bit simpler. All building systems and vehicles powered by clean electricity. We're fighting a little bit of an uphill battle um, with this right now in terms of what we're dealing with in grid electric supply. Um, but again, hopefully those renewable portfolio standards are gonna shift this picture for us a little bit. Um, buildings in our major cities already use more electricity than they do gas. Um, but that electric supply produces slightly more greenhouse gas emissions um, than on-site combustion at this point. By focusing on the loading order I've put in front of you, efficiency first, adding renewable energy targets, and then electrifying buildings, we can really change this picture so that the electrification of our buildings is not as scary as a lot of people are making it out to be. The biggest problem that we're having in this space, though, is this backlash. Um, with the idea that people are wanting to move to electrification, there have been a huge number of uh, opportunities in state legislation to go through um, and distract the market by banning gas bans, basically. Um, and so we need to actually change this map. The pink here is where um, state legislation has been passed, prohibiting local governments from restricting natural 
gas utility services. And this includes or would include things like codes that mandate all electric new construction. This is of huge concern, um, not just for what building codes would look like, but for reaching our national targets. The next piece we're going to talk about is grid integration. Um, what this means in a building uh, is the buildings in can include controls and storage to respond to time of use carbon and resilience signals that would be supplied by the electric grid, by the utility grid. The way our buildings interact with the electric grid is really rapidly evolving. We're moving quickly away from a one-way grid, which we're all sort of the way we understand our electricity to move um, and moving into a space where buildings will face increasing regulatory and economic pressure to be able to respond to those changing utility rate and delivery structures. Designers are going to need to understand and incorporate strategies that allow buildings to directly interact with the utility grid. And adapting to an interactive grid will be critical in maintaining building services and comfort. Uh, and grid dependability in the future. Efforts to decarbonize the electric grid will require better integration of these distributed energy resources that we're putting into our buildings. And then to illustrate the overall impact of what these different pieces would give you, um, this is a typical energy demand of a commercial office building. Once we apply some sort of stringent energy efficiency measures, we can shift that demand down. When we equip a building with solar PV, um, we can really shift how much energy it's using at all times of the day compared, um, obviously the sun is up as we see this dip down. And then when we provide a grid integrated building with energy efficiency, solar PV, um, and that load flexibility, which would incl include storage, we can smooth this shape back out so that it's not only getting the benefit of the solar supply when the sun is shining, um, but can use that in these, in these side areas to help decrease its demand on the grid overall. Finally, life cycle impacts. We need to design for embodied carbon refrigerants and deconstruction of buildings to reduce the life cycle greenhouse gas impact of our buildings. This relies largely right now in talking about embodied carbon. Um, building materials and construction uh, contribute 11% to um, global greenhouse gas emissions. Building operations, which I've been talking about up to this point, contribute 28%. And while you can say that 28 is larger than 11, also everything I've presented to you thus far is saying that we are going to start to close that 28% down. And so that materials and construction impact is naturally going to grow larger. This is one of the times where the pie is the whole pie. And so as you make one piece smaller, you're going to naturally make the next one larger. So to talk about buildings in their entirety, we're also going to need to um, focus on what we're doing when we're constructing our buildings with these materials. All right, real quick, I'm going to just preview what might be some policy solutions to make all of this possible. At the federal level, appliance standards create an issue with what we call in the building code world federal preemption. Basically, the fact that the federal government controls the appliance standards limits whole pages of my code book. Um, and those limits on the efficiency of building systems limits the overall progress of the code to meet high performance building targets. If we can't adjust those uh, systems to be more efficient and mandate that they be more efficient, our whole buildings are kneecapped. Additionally, there's a federal role in the certification of model energy codes and the review of state energy codes. This is the current map of how the states have adopted the codes. There is a real lack of um, enforcement at the DOE and the federal level to require that these states bring their codes up to, you know, even the penultimate version of the most recent model code would save hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, in the pockets of consumers, but also the required energy and carbon that we need. 
And then there's federal programs. And I want to say that programs like Energy Star Homes and DOE's Net Zero Energy Ready Home, they have great marketing, right? There are YouTube videos. But these programs need to be focused not only on producing a fairly efficient home, but a very efficient home, the most efficient home. And they need to be zero carbon. This great marketing really needs to be combined with the climate solutions we need to be able to push the market forward. Beyond the federal legislation, we have issues with what we call state level preemption. Um, how jurisdictions can apply the code is limited by the state laws in many places. Jurisdictions in these states sort of don't control their own code destiny, as it were. They're held back from meeting their own climate goals, um, and more importantly, held back from contributing to the national goals because of the way that legislation is set up in their states that mandates that they cannot go above the code that is set by the state. And finally, the jurisdictions are further limited by the traditional code development processes that I started out explaining to you. NBI has always been seen as a leader uh, in developing sort of custom solutions, custom roadmaps, and custom code language that jurisdictions are asking for to move beyond the model code language. And we've seen a real uptick in this. Um, in recent years with the inconsistent progress of the model energy codes. We are going to continue to provide this support, but we are trying to also shift the way that we think about providing the support to make it more equitable. Not every jurisdiction can afford to create custom language, and not only can they not afford to spend the money to do it, it creates a little bit of market confusion when you move from state to state to be able to really focus on, uh, on what those, those codes are doing and what they're asking for. And the more we can unify the market around a single, a single code that pushes on all levers, that creates the solutions that the building space needs to meet a 1.5 degree target, the better shape we're all in. And then finally, just because my comms team will absolutely yell at me when I get off this if I don't put this slide up, um, NBI, join us in New York. This fall, we're hoping to all be there together, getting to Zero Forum October uh, 27th through 29th. We'll be talking about all of this stuff and more. That's it. Thank you so much, Dan. Thank you, Kim. That was a great presentation. So it's totally fine that you added your plug at the end, for sure. Um, I, I'd like to very quickly um, go into a little bit of detail. You described the 10% improvement in the last code um, the 2021 IECC. Could you very briefly um, describe some of the measures, the updated measures that were, that sort of add up to that 10%? What specifically are we talking about when we talk about energy improvements or energy efficiency improvements and resilience that have resilience benefits that are, um, that have become part of the code more recently? That's a great question, Dan. Um, so, you know, some of the things that we saw, we saw all, like incremental improvements in the envelope um, across a lot of different spaces. Um, we saw some improvement in envelope testing. Um, so looking at air tightness and, and how much our buildings are uh, giving away free heating or free cooling to the outdoors. Um, and then we also saw some changes in sort of the structure of the IECC. So there's now what sort of um, a points option, um, although I will, it's, it's a little bit weird to say it like that because it's not optional, you have to do it. You just get to select the way that you do it. So there are several measures um, spelled out in both the residential and commercial sections where designers have a little bit of flexibility um, to pick the measures that are best for them. Um, but those measures all add up to a certain amount of savings over the previous version of the code. So there you can get points for increased mechanical uh, equipment efficiency, um, better envelope, better you know, air sealing again, um, and a couple different, a couple other areas. But those are sort of the key tweaks that were being made. Like I said, we're really limited in that mechanical space because of the federal issue um, and really looking for federal leadership in that space so that not only can we do our part in the code as much as we can, but the that legislation, you know, those standards can be changed to help us do our best. Thank you for that. Yeah, the inability to move beyond um, sort of current standards for heating and cooling equipment in, 
heating equipment in particular is, is pretty bad. Well, thank you so much for that excellent presentation. If anyone in our audience missed it, you can visit us online at www.eesi.org um, to see Kim's presentation, uh, either the slides or the archived presentation itself. So thank you very much. Um, Kim, you also in that slide uh, mentioned a couple other organizations. Um, I will uh, plug our friends at the Appliance Standards Awareness Project. If you have questions, you want to do a deep dive into some of those issues, that's also an excellent resource. So I just wanted to make sure, I think that uh, graphic that you had on your slide actually is sourced from ASAP. So they do great stuff. Thank you so much. Uh, I get to introduce our fifth panelist uh, to now, and it um, um, kind of a perfect way to wrap up the panel um, by helping us put everything that we've just heard in um, in perspective. Um, and uh, I'm really excited to introduce Jacqueline Patterson. Uh, Jackie is the senior director of the NAACP Environmental and Climate Justice Program. Since 2007, Jackie has served as coordinator and co-founder of Women of Color United. She has worked as a researcher, program manager, coordinator, advocate, and activist, working on women's rights, violence against women, HIV and AIDS, racial justice, economic justice, emergency response, uh, and environmental and climate justice. Uh, Jackie holds master's degrees from the University of Maryland and, the Johns, and Johns Hopkins University. She currently serves on the advisory boards for the Center of Earth, for Earth Ethics, the High Fund for Gender and Climate Justice, as well as on the boards of directors for the Institute of the Black World, Greenpeace, the Bill Anderson Fund, People's Solar Energy Fund, the American Society of Adaptation Professionals, another ASAP, uh, and the National Black Workers Center Project. Jackie, uh, welcome to the uh, panel today. I'm really looking forward to your presentation. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here with you all. I hope you can hear me okay. Okay, yeah. So I am excited to be able to hopefully provide an exclamation point on what has already been said and just talk a little bit about uh, nuance, uh, critical nuance in terms of how do we how do we get there in terms of kind of this notion of a win-win on climate. When, when we talk about this now, we feel we're at a point where, as you know, with the climate clock ticking, with us um, in the midst of this syndemic, as they say, of, uh, of kind of overlapping um, disasters with, uh, with the COVID-19, with the climate crisis, with the economic crisis, and certainly with the, with the racial uprising, it's more important than ever. Well, it's, it's always been important, but now we're kind of cleaning up, but uh, to address really the, the root causes, or we're going to continue to have the eruptions of the, of the manifestations of the core rot um, in our society. And so unless we really push for, for true systemic change, we're going to continue to find ourselves in the same place. So this moment really calls for us to be aspirational, to be bold, to be to do what's as uh, Missy Stoltz from uh, Ann Arbor said in a recent call I was on with her. She and she's actually with ASAP, um, the group that I'm on the board of. She talked about this notion in, with Ann Arbor planning of being doing what's audacious but necessary. And at this point, audaciousness is necessary for us to get to where we need to 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 go here. So, first of all, it's kind of foundational when we talk about where we need to be is to, to that we have to collectively reject the myth of scarcity and embrace the reality of abundance whether we're talking about regenerative regenerative systems of, of food whether we're talking about the regenerative design that we need for our building whether we're talking about the regenerative nature of energy if we do it if we do our energy through clean energy then it's possible for us to really reach the, the heights that we need to reach in terms of the types of transitions that we need in our society away from an, a society and practices and policies that are are doing what they're they're were intended to do we talk about kind of unintended consequences but we also know that 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 contrary to this notion of the nation being founded on principles of 
of, 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 of freedom and religious freedom and liberty and so forth that was actually founded on practices of exploitation, extraction, domination, and, and displacement. And so we have to turn away from that and shift to a society. And it's possible. It's not this utopian concept. We know it's been done in different places. And we'll talk about some of these examples. But we have to shift to a society that's rooted in principles and practices around regeneration, around cooperation, because we're all we're all interdependent. The ecosystem is interdependent, and we have to lean into that interdependence, or it's all going to continue to fall apart. Whether it's bee colonies, ant colonies, we all the the nature has has um, has modeled for us the way that we need to be. And if we just lean into biomimicry and uh, and and replicate the, the the divine design of our earth systems, then we can really we can all thrive and not and 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 instead of just some of us barely even surviving. So with that, um, we know that we we can re reject this notion of scarcity and embrace the, the reality of abundance. And we have to do it by following the science. The science is is based on on the the, the realities of what we know what's what's measurable in terms of our earth systems and how we do it needs to be following the principles that have been set forth by frontline communities from the Hemez principles of democratic organizing. Or actually yesterday I learned because I met someone from Hamez, that is pronounced Hamez principles, but of democratic organizing, the um, environmental justice principles that were put together in 1991, the um, the Bali principles on climate justice, the, the, the frontline communities have laid out the how we do it, letting people speak for themselves, uh, um, making sure that we have bottom up organizing committing to self-transformation because each of us has to recognize our role in it and, and be willing to make that commitment to change. And so even as we as we try to, to dismantle the system that's built on the intended consequences of extraction, exploitation, and oppression of certain people, we have to do so in a way that even that, so that even well-intended efforts, whether it's the Justice 40 or the other types of efforts that are going on, don't have unintended consequences. We And, and through and the only way we're going to be able to make sure that we don't have those unintended consequences, even as we dismantle the systems with intended consequences of, of, uh, of marginalization, is to make sure that we have everyone at the table so that there is there are no margins. The table is a common table that we're all at making our, our, our um, making our design for, for a society that uplifts all rights for all people. So. <clears throat> Again, we, we know that we've we've put people on the moon. We've we've uh, we've come up with a with a, a vaccine for COVID in, in record time. We've uh, we've done so. We've 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 uh, developed developed the interweb. <laughs> we've done so many things that, looking back in time, that people wouldn't have even been able to conceptualize, much less think are are possible, um, and much less implement. And yet we've done it. So we have. We have the ability to, to do all of this. And so it's already working in different places. As we think about changing each and every one of our systems, we have to make sure that national policies and programs support local vision and leadership. As we say, all politics are local. So whether we're talking about coastal pre preservation, as the first panelist was talking about, we know that groups like the Gullah Geechee Nation is working with groups like Climate Central and NOAA to, to develop an app even on how do they uh, assess their risk for sea level rise and how do they begin to plan, plan for that in that matriarchal society. We know groups like ECHO in Mississippi is working with the community communities like Turkey Creek, which are which are under threat from their the the development that's happening on the wetlands by one of these these developers. And they're pushing back and saying the wetlands again are part of this divine design of our earth systems. And it, they're 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 designed to, to, to be able to, to absorb the water. And as we as we are having this increase in sea level rise, flooding and so forth, Let's lean into those natural protections as opposed to, again, profits over people, letting a development take take away the natural protections that this frontline community um, would have would would uh, would have in order to protect it from the from the 
from the encroaching waters. And so as, as, as we think about national federal policies, we have to have strong um, federal policies in place around wetlands restoration that intersect. And we have to always think about intersectional policy making so that it's not just, oh, this is just going to be in this particular sector and not recognizing again what uh, the unintended consequences of not incorporating across sector our policy making. So as, as um, Audrey Lord said, we can't have single issue solutions because we don't live single issue lives. So when we talk about wetlands restoration we are, or preservation, we have to make sure that wetlands preservation is in concert with development policies and how do we how, how we're permitting um, development. We have to make sure that our national flood insurance pro, um, policies, that there's intersection between the, the, the flood insurance programming and the housing programming and so forth so that we have strong national flood insurance program that, that really protect people um, as opposed to having a, a kind of a, a myopic focus on climate risks to the extent that it's only protecting properties or protecting uh, a budget or protecting as opposed to protecting people and, and people's well-being. Um, we have to, to be smart about um, how we are doing managed retreat planning so that it's not something that's happening to us down the line where we're scrambling to figure out what's what's to happen, but we're thinking now about how do we reconfigure our our budget so that we have enough investment for for a managed retreat for for community so that if, if community wants to to retreat all together, then there's resources for them to be able to maintain community and not be divided asunder by by the need to 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 move back from the shoreline. We, we've already had folks talking about energy democracy. Um, again, following state and local leadership, we have the great work of the Portland Clean Energy Fund and of the Future Energy Jobs Act in Illinois, um, the offshore wind bill in Maryland. The key to each and every one of those policies was having everyone at the table, making sure that we develop those policies in a way that are intersectional. It wasn't just about energy, it was energy with the through line of economic justice. So making sure that there's provisions for local hire provisions, there's provi provisions for fair chance hiring, that and that and that um, local frontline communities, there's racial justice, um, dis disadvantaged business or enterprise provisions, and um, the local communities are in, in the lead. And our national um, policies have to follow the same, having a national energy efficiency resource standard, making sure that we're helping um, rural communities, again, not forgetting anyone, that there is that we need to eliminate the margins, not just address people who are on the margin, but not actually have margins anymore. Again, thinking aspirationally, we have to think beyond kind of making things better for people who are poor, making things less bad for, you know, for people uh, with different racial, for racialized people, we have to actually eliminate those barriers as opposed to just mitigating those barriers. And so similarly, so in, under energy democracy, uh, uh, democracy, we have to retire the federally held coal debt that's holding back rural electric co-ops from being able to join the clean energy economy. As we think of our food systems, follow the example of groups like Soul Fire Farm and the Earth Seed Collective and, and, and enable us to have locally produced um, healthy and nutritious foods through strengthening projects like the um, programs like the Farmers Market Promotion Program and the, um, and the WIC Farmers Market Support. Um, when we think about transportation, we follow the leadership of groups who are in the Transit, Equi Transit Equity Day Network, like the Massachusetts folks who got the T-Pass for Youth, the Bus Riders Union in LA who have the mantra of a thousand more buses, a thousand less police, and follow with national policies and programs like increasing our inner city um, inter-city transportation infrastructure so that people in rural areas can get to where they need to go, whether it's for jobs or whether it's so that they have um, equal access to COVID-19 vaccines. We also have to make sure that we have um, more in the way of satellite um, satellite provision so that there's equal access across where, no matter where you live. And also make sure that there's federal assistance for increased um, municipal infrastructure around electrification. And, and again, with the aspirational vi vision that's doable of eliminating the combustible engine because it's frontline communities who are on the front lines of that near roadway air pollution. My time went pretty fast. I only have three minutes left, so I'm going to kind of, I'm already talking like an auctioneer. It's going to get even worse, but um, I'll make sure that you, you get these notes. But um, when you think about labor, we already have groups like the Washington Interface Network that is doing work around, that has done flood management work and has, um, has been very explicit about bringing in 
um, people who are um, who are at risk or other uh, youth and, and folks seeking jobs to be a part of the workforce for flood management. We have the homeboys industry in Los Angeles that, for, that employs um, uh, formerly incarcerated persons in, um, in solar installation and um, in energy efficiency retrofits. We have a national leading national networks on these issues like the Labor Network for Sustainability, the NAACP's Black Labor Initiative on Just Transition, the National Black Worker Center Project. These are the groups on whose leadership we have to rely. And when we think about federal policies, we think of how we make, make sure that as we think about transitioning workers from the fossil fuel economy, that, um, that we really make sure that there's a high road jobs guarantee for transitioning workers. And that needs to be right next to our clean energy goals, not just like we're going to have these clean energy goals and we're going to make sure that this happens. Like they need to be next to each other in in tandem, that we make sure that these high road jobs are in place, that pensions are in place, that um, health care is in place for the work for the families of displaced workers. Um, and then also in terms of um, of, uh, of, of labor, we have to think about, as I don't know if folks saw that when the when the uh, forest fires were happening last year, there was a kind of a comment about all the COVID that was happening in prisons and therefore there were there was less, that resource isn't available for um, for fighting the forest fires, and so again, the objectification of prisoners in the context of, of fighting forest fires. We have to think about pr prisoners and their labor rights as opposed to, to just people to be used. Again, with that dehumanization. Um, so I'm I have some points around emergency management waste, but uh, I'll skip sk I'll skip those. Well, maybe just briefly in terms of ways we have to move. To, we have local leadership around zero waste policy. Policies. Nationally, we have to make sure that we are following and supporting um, the zero waste, the zero, the waste transition. We also have to make sure that we have less toxic waste, so that if, so that um, so that as we transition away from burying and burning waste, that what's what the what that are the products that we're using in our households aren't um, aren't toxic in the first place. So we have to, to significantly strengthen the toxic release inventory and so forth. And um, also around disasters, making sure at the federal level, we follow what's happening at the local level, whether it's the mutual aid that's happening in the context of COVID-19, the just recovery work that's happening. We have to make sure that at the federal level that we follow the same principles around just recovery, whether it's making sure that levy reinforcement prioritizes people versus protecting prop prioritizing property values. We have to make sure that there's resources for renters versus tying all the significant aid to, to homeowners. And then some of the cross-cutting things we need to look at include making sure that even as we talk about the Justice 40, that it's not just kind of even the folks who are the most advantaged of dis disadvantaged um, communities, that we make sure that we're reaching the communities that are on the far reaches, that aren't even on the margins that we're trying to eliminate, that they're not even on the map at all. We have to reach those folks. We also have to cross-cutting, um, make sure that we have universal broadband access because so much of the resources that are available out there, we can find out what they are, even no matter where we are, if we have universal broadband access. As it relates to the Paris Agreement, we have to make sure that the US not only gets back in, but even when we were in before, we were playing an obstructionist role. We have to get back in, make strong commitments, and actually be a leader in, in ambition, not a leader in obstruction. Finally, Three more things, four more things. I, I echo Kim's statement about preemption, not only at the federal level, but at the state level. Um, we have to move away from, from this because again, all politics are local and local folks know what, what's needed for their situation. We have to uh, to have uh, increase our immigration policies in terms of sanctuary, refuge, recognizing the US is 4% of the global population, but 25% of the emissions that drive climate change that are driving people to need to, to come to a place of abundance because they're leaving places that we have stripped and, and made them places of scarcity. And so we have to, 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 sh to share that wealth, it, it, not just because we're responsible, but also because we should be good neighbors that, that share the abundance. And then finally, um, and also recognizing that part of our abundance was at the expense of those very communities. So just really re re recognizing that relationship. And then we have to, th to, to prioritize getting money out of politics and um, because we see that so many of the policies that were intended 
um, in terms of the consequences of marginalization were because of the people who, who, who treasured pop profits over people. And we have to dismantle those systems and then center center racism in, in our policy making um, and, and recognizing that as we as we do these executive orders and so forth and, and other congressional um, initiatives that we that we address racism at every at every um, in, our, in all policy because that racism is uh, is present in all on all practices and the racism, the intended racism is pra is present in all policies and we have to dismantle the racism with the same level of intention. So, thank you. Well, thank you, Jackie. I I'll admit that I was a little tempted to send you a chat to say no, you're fine on time, but you're on such a roll that I didn't want to interrupt. Thank you. <laughs> um, you you called yourself an auctioneer, but um, I'm buying what you're selling. So you know, <laughs> thank you. Over. I think the only person that I'm feeling for everyone probably enjoyed that immensely, except for our live tweeter, poor Kimmy, uh, trying to keep up. So um, if you would like to go back uh, and 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 um, you covered such an amazing number of programs, and they all have actually a lot to offer in terms of mitigation and <clears throat> uh, adaptation. So one final reminder that everything will be posted online and we'll also have written notes as well. So um, if one of the programs or initiatives Jackie mentioned piqued your interest, um, there will be uh, not just a recording of it, um, but, uh, but also a written record of it. Um, I'd like to take a few of our final moments, Jackie, to ask you some follow-up questions. You mentioned two things um, that I think in my mind are connected and I'd like to hear, I'd like to talk with you a little bit about them. Um, you talked about unintended consequences. You also talked about community participation. And uh, so on my soapbox, um, you know, we don't have time to unwind or undo unintended consequences. Um, and we also don't have time to sabotage, sabotage ourselves by not making optimal decisions and not including the right voices. I'd like to know what you think when we're talking about adaptation mitigation win-wins, what are the main unintended consequences that we should be on the lookout for? And how could we improve our community, our decision-making uh, to be more inclusive and equitable so that we prevent those consequences and we maximize the multiple benefits of resilience, uh, improved public health, um, lower costs, all of the good things that come with the improvements that we're talking about. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'll, I always remember when I was on a call about a, putting together an amicus brief for the clean power plan um, back in the day, and someone on the call said, as we were kind of getting through some of the gnarly parts of it, someone said, well, I think we can all agree that uh, emissions reduction in the aggregate is a good thing. And so, and, and, and I think everyone was like kind of nodding, like, oh, of course, needless to say, and I was like, oh, Actually, no, we can't agree on that because the emissions and reductions in the aggregate can mean actually increased emissions in certain places. So if we don't if we don't focus simultaneously on the aggregate and on um, on particular places, then we actually you know you, you know you you're saying that innocently like and talk about it was totally unintended. Like she never would have thought that by saying that that she actually is condemning some community out there to become in a hot spot. And so that that's an example of an unintended consequence. Um, I, I could give more, but hopefully that one kind of gives a bit of a sense. Um, and then what was the second part of the question or the second question? So it was, it was kind of unfair to me to bundle them. I should have let you answer that one first and then ask you to follow up. But um, just in terms of improving our decision making, so that you just relayed a conversation from a number of years ago. What could have been done better in the lead up to that person making that comment to avoid it from ever being said? What can we be doing to improve our decision making so that we don't, again, we don't have to, we don't have to unwind that, right? We can just do it correctly the first time and be more inclusive and equitable at, at the same time. Yeah, I mean, I think that in some ways it's not, I mean, in some ways one thing is like her saying that I think part of the problem would have, would have been, given that everybody else was kind of nodding and going along with the comment, if, you know, 
I had twisted my ankle that day or whatever. Like, you know, like then no one would have been there to say actually no. Like, you know, so even at that point, it was, it would, that's a, that's a community participation point where we're all planning together what we're going to do on this together. So that, that's a learning moment. So as long as making sure that in any of those those conversations that we have an inclusive table that again we eliminate the margins and everyone's at the table like we we and also making sure that that's a safe space for her so that it's said in a certain way because in some ways if like even though she kind of put that out there it's not i think just making sure that we have safe spaces for these conversations so that so that like people can put an idea out there like that and then there's there's people there who can kind of say to bring different perspectives on what the unintended consequences would be for example so having making sure that we are like we know the FERC, for example just is putting together their office of public participation um, after all of these years, and we were talking about how, you know, over these, that how do we make that meaningful in terms of decision making? Because right now, one of the points that was made by Ted Glick, who's done a lot of work with FERC over the years, is that, you know, out of the 1,012 per, um, permit applications, whether um, the comments were 99 to 1 opposed, they they went forward that out of a thousand and twelve applications only six were denied and yet there, there were there was hearing after hearing where the comments were 99 to 1 opposed and so what does that mean in terms of participation if you're just talking and people are making notes but they're doing what they want to do anyway then that's not that's not the kind of um, process that we want so making sure that there's a table for dialogue but that we put the measures in in place that, that the dial that what's being said by frontline communities is actually heated so me saying that at that conversation if that didn't lead to us saying okay well then we'll put in the brief that we're going to make sure that we do point source reductions as a, in addition to making sure that we have aggregate um, um, goals, then that would have been a problem. But making sure that I'm there or whoever is there to make that comment and then it's actually implemented, that's the key. Well, that's a, a, a great example um, of uh, a, a great example and also um, some, some very thoughtful advice for how we should be structuring these things going forward. So I really appreciate it. Um, wonderful presentation, um, an excellent way to um, put everything that we had previously talked about in very important context. So thank you uh, to Jackie, thank you to Kim, thank you to Russ, thank you to John, and thank you to Baskar. That's impressive, I went backwards in order. Usually I'm, I can only go in one direction, but today. Uh, thank you uh, to five wonderful panelists um, who joined us today to help our audience understand um, some really impressive uh, or some really um, potentially impactful climate double whammies, um, things we can do to improve our adaptation and uh, while also mitigating uh, and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So thank you so much. We couldn't do any of these uh, without our excellent panelists. And this was uh, the fourth in our cl Congressional Climate Camp series. So just one other thank you to everyone who was on our three previous panels uh, as well. Um, it's a really impressive um, uh, collection of uh, experts and practitioners. If anyone missed anything, um, everything today, everything in our previous congressional climate camps, pretty much everything at every ESI briefing uh, is posted online, www.eesi.org. You can um, watch the presentations, view the presentations, read summary notes. And for these congressional climate camps, we're also splitting up the individual presentations. So if you um, are, are pressed for time, or if you know exactly what you need to see, hopefully that makes it a little bit easier for you. And we're also gonna be releasing a condensed version of today's program uh, as an episode of our podcast, The Climate Conversation. Um, we have decided to schedule a bonus Congressional Climate Camp. Uh, we're looking at May 21st, and we'll be specifically looking at uh, climate policy uh, and what may be achievable using um, budget reconciliation, which is something that's quite a lot in the news, so stay tuned on that. In the meantime, um, we have uh, two briefings coming up in the next few weeks. Uh, the, on May 7th, which is next Friday, uh, Natural Climate Solutions, a win-win solution for our environment and our economy. Um, uh, that is uh, one that um, we're, we're co-sponsoring um, with a group, uh, U.S. Nature for Climate. Um, so uh, a new partnership there that we're really, really pleased to, to um, work with them on. I hope you'll have an opportunity to RSVP for that uh, and join us. Uh, and then on May 12th, which is the following Wednesday, I'm pretty sure, 
Ambition and Opportunity in America's New Climate Commitments. Uh, this briefing was just announced uh, when we found out the details of, or the uh, announcement of the US nationally, nationally determined contribution. So we'll be joined by three um, top uh, climate thinkers uh, to help us understand and, and what's in the nationally determined, the NDC, but also help orient uh, a congressional policymaking audience for sort of what it actually means for what needs to be done. Um, we always, uh, and the best way uh, to keep up with all of our programming is, of course, to subscribe to our biweekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions. Um, we have a survey link that I think will come up here on the screen in just a moment. Um, please, if you have a moment or two, uh, if you take our survey, uh, we read every response. We find it extremely useful. Um, we always want to do better. We want to provide the most relevant and timely information to our audience. So if you have thoughts about what you saw or heard today, or if you had any technical issues or audio issues or anything like that, please let us know and we'll do our best to correct it. Um, and, uh, and your time taking that survey is very much appreciated. Um, let me also say thank you to everyone on Team EESI who helped make today possible. Uh, Dan O'Brien, Henri Laporte, Anna McGinn, Amber Todoroff, Savannah Bertrand, uh, Sydney O'Shaughnessy, and our five fabulous interns, Jocelyn, Hamza, Celine, Rachel, and Kimmy. And special shout out to Hamza. Today is his last day of his internship, and he has done so much great work for us this semester. It's been a real joy to get to know him. So good luck to you, Hamza. Thanks very much for everything you did, uh, helping us pull off um, a pretty aggressive set of congressional education uh, programming during these critical months of the 117th Congress. Um, uh, I think we'll go ahead and end it there. It says 401. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today in our audience. Thanks once more to Baskar, John, Russ, Kim, and Jackie for being excellent panelists and for providing such excellent presentations. I uh, hope everyone has a great weekend, at least in the DC area. It looks like it's going to be great weather for um, some outdoor time. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll see you next Friday for um, natural climate solutions, a win-win solution for our environment and our economy. Thank you so much.